Good morning, Saints. Today's date is May the 5th, 2019. And we are living in truly amazing times. Amen? Amen. Pastor Wade and Pastor Zeke are preaching in Nepal right now. Come on. Come on. We all look forward to them coming home soon. Huh? Do y'all miss Pastor Wade? Yeah. Me too. Well, I hope that over the past week or so, you've been able to begin to grasp and appreciate how special what the Lord is doing at LCM. You, everybody point to yourself. You are part of one of the most active and unified global families that I have ever heard or seen before. That's saying something. This brother's been in the kingdom almost three decades. One of the reasons that he says that is think of the activity that's going on all around us. I, I'm just sitting looking at one sexy grandma on the front row right now. <laughs> She's changing colors even as I'm talking about her. You know, we got a new car this year. That was a blessing. You know what was a bigger blessing? In under 60 days, we drove 12,000 miles. <laughs> Woo! Multiple times to Submission Ministries in Virginia. Many, many times to King's Harvest in Louisiana. Many times to New Life Ministries in Victoria. We've made frequent visits to Dallas with Pastor Hutchinson at Remnant. We even went out of the country with a few churches. The Arising Church and us went all the way to Israel together. You know, yesterday, I got a chance to do something very, very strange. If all of this weren't overwhelming enough, I spoke with Romanian friends. Say Romanian. And they were living in Perth, Australia. That in itself is strange. Couldn't wait to tell me the way in which our ministry is affecting their life. Now, my friend, Raul Pascu, he has suffered from glaucoma for years. He's seen all of the best specialists. If he went a couple days without eye drops, he, he was in a lot of pain. He got totally healed of glaucoma. They're listening to and participating in the ministries of the One Association, and it's blessing them. They've also started a small home group of about 20 people, Romanians in Perth, Australia, reaching out to the rest of the world. If you begin to grasp what the Lord is doing all over the globe, this little garage church is affecting people. And uh, that really is what our walk is about. I, I spoke with Opingo Magera Bush yesterday for a couple hours, one of my Kenyan friends. He said, we are standing in buildings that y'all built and we are teaching the teachings that you gave us. He said, my wife and I want to thank your church because we wouldn't exist in the body of Christ without what you guys are doing. Amen. Friends, that really is a life that is worth living. You know, in two days, we head to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we will be doing the same thing there that we do everywhere else. We'll win disciples, we'll strengthen the church, and we'll assist the leaders. This community is completely dedicated to putting Acts 14, 21 through 23 into action, and I want to thank you for it. Are you guys blessed what comes out of this ministry? Yeah. You know that this way of life has given us a perspective on a worldwide relationship that has lasted decades. Yeah. Not just a couple of months, but decades. I'm going to take that, Facebook. We know exactly what real discipleship and a quality work looks like. We're master shipbuilders in this house. In dozens of countries, there are people praising God for this ministry and what Jesus has made possible through you, each yeah. and every one of you guys. And today we're going to be talking about tent makers. Yeah. The title of today's message is Tent Makers. Come on, my brother and I, my big brother and I, are sharing this message because this is who we is. This is what we are. That God has made us tent makers. And what it is, you're, you also are becoming, right? Amen. We're in the business of making tent makers. Some will think I'm referencing a bivocational ministry. And I am. But it's far more than just that. Yeah, in fact, I don't know anybody that's not bivocational. How many people in this church have been moved by members of the church? Yeah. Yep. 
How, how many of you have ever had something that Matthew, Wade, or I have come to your house and repaired? Yeah, look, look around. All your hands should go up. Right? All we're doing is arguing about the percentage of preaching and teaching. That's, that's all, all we're at. All men of God ought to be bivocational. You show me a guy hiding behind a desk with a, a leather bookcase behind him, and uh, we will not see a conqueror in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to have calluses on our hands, and you don't get them from turning pages in your Bible. You get them from actually working in the real world. Yes. Our message today is called Tent Makers. This is because Pastor Matthew and Justin Treister spoke last Sunday on building the name. Was that an amazing message? Yeah. I was listening to it on the way back from Dallas, and Nick and I, you know, caught the old-fashioned Holy Ghost. We are having trouble keeping it on the road, crying, repenting, praying for infilling. I loved that message. Wednesday, I did my very best to encourage you with a message called Fire and Glory, a Roadmap to Corporate Revival. Are you fired up? Yeah. Has it already faded? No. Well, amen. Oh, my brother did more than just his best. He brought the fire. Amen. Well, this is something that God's been speaking to us. Let's look at that next slide as a recap of some of the things that we covered. This first word we, that we covered was yachad, a plurality in unity. Yes, yeah, that guttural sound on the CH. You got to get that. We learned from this that we must be in unity with God and men of God. Did you guys get that concept? Yes. Second one, kadash. This is holy. And that is you must be being made holy. But here was the, the new twist that gave a deeper revelation and making others holy. In addition to being in unity with God and men, we are in the business of being holy and making others holy. The last word was nagash. A singular focus, our singular focus is to approach the Lord. That means your sole focus must be in approaching the Lord even at the expense of denying, hear this saints, non-sinful desires. Was that eye-opening for you guys? Yes. It was for me. We looked at a pattern in this next slide that started in Exodus 19. In Exodus 19, the trumpet call of God grew louder and louder as God spoke with Moses. We went through Leviticus 9 and saw fire and glory also falling. In 2 Chronicles 5, we noticed that there were 120 trumpeters sounding with one voice which of course brought us to the first chapter of Acts, where we have 120 men wanting to speak with God, praying constantly, and fire and glory fell in the Newer Testament church. Let's look at the next slide, and we'll recap some of these basic principles of how they got to that point in the book of Acts. A plurality in unity, being holy and making others holy. A singular focus is to approach the Lord. This led to corporate revival that we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That takes us to where we want to start with you today. Having clearly illustrated a pattern that will bring you expected results. Yeah. Say expected. Expected. You get into unity with God and men of God. You get holy and begin making others holy. If you approach Him with a singular focus, something happens, not sometimes, every time. Amen. He will meet you with his fire and manifested glory. We saw it Wednesday night. Now, as we get into tent making, with that pattern in our mind, I want to talk to you about Psalm 139. You can turn there. Psalm 139, begin in verse 7. Come on, where are the rest of you? You getting there? This is, uh, this is David speaking. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths or Sheol, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say surely the darkness will hide me, and light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. The reason we're reading this passage, and many Christians are familiar with it, 
is because when you think of the Lord as being everywhere, it's difficult to conceptualize him being anywhere. It's kind of like air. Air is all around us, but when you think of air, what do you think of? It's difficult to wrap your mind around until there's a more singular event. Let's look at this further in Jeremiah 23, verse 23. Say there when you're there. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. We're talking about this difficulty to conceptualize. And in putting in context, God is filling the heavens and earth. And this is exceedingly beyond just the word awesome. You know, we can barely conceptualize what it's like to fill a stadium full of 90,000 people. And the truth of the matter is, this should lead to you feeling immersed, right? Relating back to air, that it surrounds us everywhere that we go. It supplies the life that we need. But for most, it's going to leave a feeling of being distant and separated from who God is. Do you hear the heart of the Father as these words are being written, though? While it's difficult for us to conceptualize, hard to wrap yourself around, in both passages, the Lord is expressing being near to the people. The, The people are acknowledging there's nowhere they go and He's not present with them. That's because there is a precious proximity to the Lord, even if it is hard to grasp or, or to conceptualize. In Acts 17, I rarely lie when I'm preaching, I'll get this right. If you get there, praise God. If not, listen to me. From one man, Acts 17, 26, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him And perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Do you hear his precious proximity to people? And yet they still have to reach out and find him, even though he's not far. Which it begs the question, where is God? What does God look like? How would you draw him? How would you represent him in the latest 3D movie? Is it Morgan Freeman? John Kerry? Jim Kerry, I should say. John Kerry's a weird looking French politician, isn't he? Nowhere close no, to that. No, he's God, a yeah. US politician. He just looks French. How about Steve Carell? How how would you represent the Lord? See This is uh, something that Christians jump to without ever considering what the Scripture says. If we look at the Bible from Revelation back to Genesis, it produces a certain view. If you look from Genesis in the other direction towards the book of Revelation, everything changes. I want to show you what I mean in these couple slides. Deuteronomy 4.12 is right on the middle of your screen. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. Say, saw no form. form. There was only a voice. Exodus 33, 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. How about John 6, 46? No one. Somebody say, no one. No one. Has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only. Say, only. Only. Only he has seen the Father. How about John 1.18? No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. Are you beginning to get this picture? Colossians, speaking of Jesus, said he is the image of the invisible God. The image of something invisible. Wrap your mind around that. 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Okay, 1 Timothy 6.15. Clearly. Without any question, it says, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. Catch this phrase. Whom no one has seen or can see. How about 1 John 4, 12? 
This, if eight doesn't do it, I don't know what would. Invariably, we'll stand up and argue with someone after this about Christophanes and the angel of the Lord. And you have the right to be wrong if you want to. But this clear <laughs> is clear in the word. You can't get any more push out than this. No one has ever seen God. Do you see that? Now, do you think that the Apostle John was familiar with the Moses account? Do you? And look at what he says. No one has ever seen God. Now, the reason that I say all of that is because the Father surrounds everything. And He has no form. He has no image. He is not something that you can conceptualize or grasp until He does something very specific. Let's go to Numbers chapter 7 and see how God begins to help us in this matter. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Testimony. And he did what with them, saints? He spoke with them. You know, the blessing that we have is that we can look back and see that God gave Israel a focal point. Although he is everywhere, he gave them a visible representation of his presence. What, what kind of day that must have been like, yeah. right? We're in here in worship. We're fighting to get into his presence. And for most part, we're going by just feeling and the sensation of being led by his presence. But imagine it there between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, God speaks to his nation. There was a voice coming out between from these cherubim. And it gave everyone in Israel a reference point, a point to focus on. So that they could realize and understand that the God who is everywhere is also suddenly in a very, very specific place. Let's go to Psalm 99 and verse 1. Say there when you're there. Do you appreciate it whenever someone gives you a focal point? We serve a God who does the exact same. In verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. You know, throughout the entirety of the Tanakh, although God is everywhere, He is envisioned on sitting on a throne wherever the ark presided. Now, if you catch this, you begin to understand something. God who is everywhere, and because of that, you have a hard time visualizing Him in any specific place. He chooses something. He chooses the Ark of the Covenant and says, I'm going to speak to you from there. So you can now begin to direct your face towards something. You can now begin to point your life towards something, and it will teach you a message. And when this Ark was made, it was made with four golden clasps and two poles that went through them that could never be removed. Do you know why? The Ark was always to be movable. Yeah. And it could only be moved in one, one way. Yeah. It had to be moved on the shoulders of men. From the very beginning of this book, God is beginning to narrow down something that cannot be conceptualized to the only one way in which a man may know the Father. Yeah. Amen. And when you consider what happens when He gives the world the focal point, it's beautiful. The visible presence of God moving... The visible presence of God interacting with people has an incredible effect on the surrounding nations. In fact, salvation breaks out everywhere. We're going to put it on the screen so you can stay where you're at in your Bible. It's Joshua 2.8. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that great fear of you has fallen on us. If we skip down to verse 11, verse 11 says, When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above, and, somebody say, and, and. on the earth below. I want you to consider something. This is Rahab speaking with spies. Rahab is a Canaanite. And she says, I know, in verse 9, I know that the Lord is giving you this land. Come on. She doesn't question God's fairness. She doesn't think about whether or not God's judgment is just. She is already siding 
with what the Word of God would later proclaim. More than that, consider what Rahab has never seen. She's never seen a Sabbath celebration in the home. She's never seen the Torah uh, scrolls. She's, she doesn't have a Tanakh. She sure doesn't have a Newer Testament. She appears to have believed even before the spies came to her. If you read verse 9 and 11 again, you'll see she believes before she speaks to them. Rahab's faith is well placed. She believed in one God, not the polytheism of her culture. She believed in a personal God who could work on behalf of those who trusted in Him. That sounds very much like Hebrews 11.6. She believed in the God of Israel who would give the land to His people. Not the God of one nation or one land. In fact, look at that phrase again. The Lord, your God, who is God in heaven above and on earth below. Do you know that's the first time in all of the Bible that phrase appears? And it's coming from a woman who has no Bible, who is not from the culture of God's people. You could say that Rahab knew, she feared, and she received from God. That's an, am I the only one that finds that incredible? As a Canaanite, Rahab is under condemnation. She's destined to die. Deuteronomy 7 says that. She was a Gentile. She's outside the covenant mercies. If there was ever a sinner that experienced graceful mercies, surely Rahab is that. Although she's surrounded by a culture in opposition to God, she makes her choice to follow the God of Israel. Do you know why all of this was possible? It was possible because the God who is everywhere was suddenly very much in one place with Israel. The Ark of Israel became the focal point And she, along with her whole nation, were watching the presence of God move with His people. How powerful is it when something becomes the focal point of what God is doing? I'm sure Rahab was able to see that focal point because she was righteous and holy, right? No, we all know exactly what Rahab was known for. Can you imagine that because God is taking this focal point and placing it upon His nation and very specifically putting it upon the Ark of His Covenant, that even the lost, those that the lost would consider lost, can see the visible, manifest presence of God in a singular focal point and begin to find salvation. Deuteronomy 4, I'm going to read this to you starting in verse 5, begins to predict this even in advance. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. This will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all these decrees, and they will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord Our God is near us whenever we pray to Him. The benefit of having this focal point in Israel was that it was easier for the nations to see Israel's relationship with God. The same that happened with Rahab can happen also with those outside of this wall. Those that are watching this video. They can look and see that something is happening between God and men. Something is stirring and moving and trying to revive and giving a, a light of hope of salvation and deliverance, just like it was for Rahab. And by nature, a focal point is a place of observable witness, meaning that it is the very spot that God is choosing to display who he is. And where there is a focal point, there's also to be an observation of results in action. Listen, one of the things that got us on this thought process is receiving phone calls around the world of people glorifying God because of something they see happening here. Yeah. On that note, how many of you know God's not all that interested in furniture? You know, now my wife can move furniture around every time I go out of the country, out of town, and I come back and I trip over it. But God, <laughs> God's not all that into furniture. That was not his goal. You know, we get really excited about a lazy boy or whatever it might be that you have in your house. The Ark of the Covenant, for all of its glory, 
It's a box about the size of your coffee table. Okay, three by five, something like that. God is not all that focused on that box. I know it seems like he is. He wanted to teach a lesson through it. Go to 1 Chronicles 15. If everybody will get there, would you like to learn? Yes. More than that, would you like to apply it? Yes. Damien, Tamika, I missed you all while I was gone. You a little bit too, Peter. <laughs> First Chronicles 15. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. What did he do? He had to prepare a place. And then he pitched a tent for it. The whole idea is that ark would never stay in one place. Yeah. There would be something specially prepared, something that would happen that was special. In fact, look at verse 3. David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem. How much of Israel? All. Sounds like unity, doesn't it? Yeah. To bring up the ark of the Lord. By the way, if you read this account in 2 Samuel, you find out what happens when somebody's breaking God's commands. Because not only do you need to be unified, you need to be holy and making others holy. Yeah. See, they are singularly focused on something right here. <laughs> David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. See, the ark was designated to be placed inside of a tent. That was always God's goal. Not just a tent, one that is specially prepared for it. Moses put the ark in a tent. Moses was a tent maker. Yeah, he was. David put the ark in a tent. David was a tent maker. Yes. In Genesis, God didn't choose furniture to bear his image for the rest of the world. He chose a man and he breathed into that man. God is a tent maker. And of all of the stories that we read in the word, they're to point us to the fire and glory of God dwelling in inside of a tent that's the entire point we're supposed to be tents housing his presence and more than that we're supposed to be in the tent making business come on are you guys in the tent making business yeah. well let's look and see exactly how god started in the tent making business i'm going to read this to you it's a very common passage john 1 verse 14 we usually memorize this by the age of 10 or so the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Did you hear what Pastor Eric was saying earlier? That God is a tent maker. That he has been in the tent making business since the beginning of time. If he had a business sign, it would say established alpha. Just the beginning of time, whenever that was. Jesus was God's workmanship so that through him as God's tent, he could display his glory. If that's the fashion in which he made Jesus, then is there any difference in which he made you? Not at all. This becomes something that's important more and more, not just the incarnation. Because God can't be conceptualized. Because there's not a way for you to wrap your mind around something that is everywhere God began to speak from between the cherubim. This allowed the nations to look and go, there's where God is. God's working with those people. I can see it in their actions. In fact, Deuteronomy said, there's no nation on earth that's wise like yeah. these people. Well, that same presence, that same throne of God, John says, is what uh, the word tabernacled among us or the word dwelt in a body tent among us. And that word is the Son of God. When Jesus says, no man comes to the Father except through me, there are many, many levels of that meaning. But one of them is, you would have no way to understand who the Father is if yeah. you weren't looking at the image of Jesus. Yeah. You would have no way to relate to the Father if it were not for Jesus. You would be trying to conceptualize air. Jesus gives us a way to relate to the Father. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now, the prophets foretold this. 
They didn't just foretell Jesus coming. They foretold a switch from an ark into a different focal point. Look at Jeremiah 3 and verse 15. You with me, Timo? Amen. 3.15. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. In those days, when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, men will no longer say, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. What will they do when they make another Indiana Jones movie? (laughs) At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their own evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah will join with the house of Israel. And together they will come from the northern land to the land I gave your forefathers as an inheritance. Look at verse 19. I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like what? Sons. And give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father, he said. Look, this prophecy is forecasting both trouble and blessing in Israel's future from Jeremiah's day. And what it's encouraging us to do is say, hey... There is a time when God is going to shift his focal point. It will be on what he is doing inside of his people. The very best example being Jesus, the Christ. The goal was never furniture. The goal was always about moving the glory of God into a tent so that men would no longer go, hey, let's go check out the Ark of the Covenant. God was not interested in ornate furniture. He was interested in ornamenting your life with his presence he had something better in mind for us jesus christ is the focal point of god this is not where the story ends though one of the most frustrating things about being in church is you can predict that this message is going in that direction in fact if all you've ever done is sit soak and sour after a while you hear the first couple verses and you're like yeah yeah we know jesus Yeah, fill in the blank, Jesus. And you work to try to maintain any kind of fervor while you were told the same thing over and over. That's because we made the starting line the finish line. And it's not. See, coming to the realization that Jesus is the focal point is the starting point of the faith. That is not the end goal of the faith. That's not all there is to the faith. That's the place where you begin to walk with God so you can run with God. Where you find a way that you walk in and it turns into a highway. An ever increasing Holy Ghost locomotive of power. That's what we're supposed to be. This is the starting line. You know, Moses was a tent maker. David was a tent maker. God is a tent maker. We're going to have to be tent makers too. Consider something we can put on a slide. Let's look at a few things in God's pattern of tent making here. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That Jesus is made in God's image. Colossians 2.9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He had God's nature, the fullness of God's nature. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Not partial, exact. By, by possessing all three of these items, it was the design of tent making that God chose to display his own son, that he had his image, that he had his nature, and that he had the radiance of his glory. These are concepts that honestly most Christians would, won't argue with because they're true, right? Yeah, yeah but we, we can espouse to these. Everybody in the room can shake their head. But there's a, a problem with it. By just acknowledging that, that these things are true can alleviate us from having to do anything about them. Yes, Jesus has his image. Jesus has God's nature. Jesus has God's glory. 
But I want you to follow me through a couple of scriptures. You know, Pastor, to illustrate that, there's not a single demon in hell that doesn't know that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Yeah. There is not a single satanic messenger that is not aware that he's the fullness of the deity. In fact, Satan himself knows that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, but what good does that do any of them? See, knowing that, knowing that is the very beginning of a starting line. It is not the end and goal of the faith. Pastor, I would say that perhaps demons have a better revelation of these three things than most Christians do. That's because he put that foot on that side of their face. Woo! Sounds like a good Western movie to me. Come on, they shudder at the name of Jesus. Because in that name are these three things. We look at this further in John 14, 20. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father. Come on, what the context is here in John 14 is that Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the spirit of truth, and he will show you all things. He will lead you into truth. And the point of truth, the focal point of truth that he is aiming you at is that Jesus is in the Father. But that's not where it stops. You need to continue reading and hopefully you can begin to get some hope in which God is making you his focal point. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father, in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Let's wrap this all together in a nice little burrito and take a big bite. <laughs> that everything that is in Jesus, you can tell I'm hungry right now, my blood sugar is getting kind of low. <laughs> everything that is in Jesus is in you to some degree. Everything that is in Jesus is inside of you right now. Not just something to hope for. Not something that you put in a, 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 an application for and waiting for it to return. It's what you have the ability to possess now. And that you do possess now. How many of you would like to turn it up a few degrees? Yes. How many of you would like to turn it up every degree? Yes. See, we cannot settle for the starting line. We are in a race. And we are both habitations for God's presence and we make tents for God's presence are you guys tent makers yeah. amen Luke 17 verse 20 let's turn there and look at this in a more clear fashion as a focal point Luke 17 20 says once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come is that a good question yeah they're not wrong in asking that. He responded, they'll be raptured. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then he handed him a brochure for his latest book. And a place to fill in a donation line. <laughs> As he retreated to the green room. Okay, we just keep going with this over and over. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation." Is that kind of a curveball? A little bit, because that's obviously what these guys were doing. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. Well, we begin to see in this next verse that God had a more clear focal point. Because the kingdom of God is where, saints? The kingdom of God is where? You are the focal point of God's kingdom on earth. That was his tent making pr purpose and focal point for you. Let's get this straight. To some degree, everything that Jesus is, is present in a believer. To some degree, the kingdom of God itself is present inside of every believer. Tell me that you've been living up to that. Tell me that walking around each day, you were thinking, wow, all the Christ is, I am standing right here. I can do what He does. I can say what He says. In fact, I can reflect the Father just like Him. That's how you came in here today, isn't it? It's not, is it? That's because we made knowing these things the finish line instead of the starting line. Now that you know them, now that you are aware of them, it has to, that revelation demands a response. We can't have some weak, uh, sagging tent. We can't have one that lacks life like a dead glove. You remember when Johnny Cochran said, if the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit? 
I'm saying if the tent is not full, it's not legit. Come on. God wants to fill the tent. He wants to fill it with His fire. Fill it with His glory. Fill it with His name. And you know what? He doesn't do that by force. He does it because His people are united. His yes. people are holy in making others holy. His people have a singular focus. We want you, Lord, and we believe that we can have your presence. And then his fire and his glory will fall in our midst. Come on. I want to show you, in one sense, the, uh, the idea of Christ is that he's in a class all by himself. Let's put that slide up. But in another sense, he's really not. In fact, we saw earlier in Colossians that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So on the right of the screen, it says God's image. Of course, Colossians also says in verse three or chapter three and verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. So get this. Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God. You are an image of God that is being renewed in Him regularly. Jesus perfect under His own merit. You perfect or being made perfect by the merit of Jesus. But you know what? The goal is still exactly the same, isn't it? Yes. In fact, this call was given to mankind to be the image bearer. But outside of Christ, you cannot accurately reflect God's glory. Let me say it another way. Inside of Christ, you must accurately reflect the image of God. Yeah. Yet that's not a burden, saints. That's not a, oh my God, I have to bite my nails. That's the highest honor and privilege in the world. Yeah. If a prostitute who may have told a fib or two in her life can watch a nation who is focused on an ark because God is speaking from that area and she can see what they are doing in their midst and get from that a saving knowledge of God. What should people be able to get from watching your life? Yeah. See, how powerful ought that be? He said, well, there was a pillar of fire that they, they followed around at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. Yeah, that pillar is supposed to have indwelt us. Yeah. How serious is that? In fact, we've said in Colossians again, that Jesus is the fullness of the deity in bodily form. I affirm that with all of my heart. But you know, He is the fullness and you participate in the deity. Yes. In fact, 2 Peter 1.4 says that so clearly. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises. So that through them, you, somebody say you, you. may participate in the divine nature. Jesus Christ is the fullness of the divine nature, but you're participating in it. Let's get this straight. He is the image of God, and you are the person being perfected into the image. Yeah. He is in God nature, and you are participating in that nature until the fullness of Him fills you in every way. Yeah. See, the starting line is understanding who Jesus is. As you begin to run, you start to understand who you are. You are not called just to acknowledge who Jesus is. Yeah. You are called to become just like Him. Amen. Look at the third one. We've said that the Son is the radiance of God's glory because Hebrews says that in the first chapter. First Peter 4 says, if you were insulted, anybody been insulted? Yeah. I was going to say, hang out here. I, I can help with this. <laughs> if you were insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. On. See, God's glory, God's nature, and God's image are all not only available to you, you are participating in them and being perfected by them. Look, how could we ever have a day where we're down? Rahab saw these things from a distance. I'm thinking of a time a young lady was speaking to Matthew and she gave her testimony. She said, ever since I stopped hoeing and uh, I wasn't aware that you could make whoring into a, a verb in that way. I didn't know if we were talking about a garden utensil or what, but I picked it up from context as slow as I am. Understand this. 
You thought it was just in Jesus' ministry that whores and tax collectors entered before the religious people? No, this has been going on yes. since God first put his focal point in the middle of a desert. And do you know why that's true? Because they're not blinded by what they already think they know. Come on, that's a good word. Okay? We have to peel this back. We have to circumcise our hearts. We have to take a fresh look at this because God wants to dwell in here in his fire and in his glory. Do you want that? Yes. Look, Moses filled the tent with a focal point that was the ark. And the presence of God filled that tent. David filled the tent with a focal point that was the mobile ark of God. And his presence, fire, and glory fell in that place. Jesus Christ is filling the tent of your body, which is the focal point of his work on earth, God's kingdom on earth. And he will fill you with fire and with glory. You just have to want it. You have to be united in that desire. And it has to be your singular pursuit. Where are you in that, saints? Are you going to sit back on your blessed assurance and just wait for somebody else to amen? Are you going to let the heavens know what you want? What do you want? See, I'm just, I, I, it's one of those days. He's coming down, guys. How big a boy are you? You're waiting because you want to make sure you have the right answer. What if you were so desperate you didn't care? What if you were willing to look stupid? Let's be honest, some of us look stupid anyway. Get over it. Something changes when we stop talking just about the work that Jesus did and going, praise God, it was all done on the cross. No, not even by a long shot. You, you have misunderstood the whole Bible if you believe that. Everything that was necessary for you to start the race was done on the cross. But it is a beginning for you. Do you know what you have to have? You have to have his fire and glory. You'll never be holy on your own. You, you will never maintain zeal on your own. You'll never experience victory over sin on your own. It will always come because you've spent time with your Father and you are now radiating His glory just Amen. like Jesus. Amen. And the way that you do that is through Jesus. You would have no idea how to relate to Him otherwise. Yeah. Saints, when I ask you what you want, the right answer should be fire and glory. What do you want? I can't help but think of pastor's analogy earlier of air and the way that God's presence surrounds us. That right now, if I asked, I'm not, and I'm not, if I asked everyone to just stop breathing, at some point your body is going to react and it's going to cry out for some air. It's happened in our services. It has. And there was revival, fire, and glory that filled that body. Well, in the same way that air is designed, our bodies are designed to absorb air and give us life. Our spirits, the tents that we are made in, the image of God, are designed to house the fire and the glory of God. And what should happen is that when you have a little bit of starvation, maybe just for a few seconds, your spirit begins to cry out, I need His fire, I need His glory. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe they've been so saturated in the presence of God that they just don't, they're not hungry anymore. Is that your problem? No. You've had all you can have? No. Your kings are ready, glorified among us. Or could you use a deeper experience with the Lord? Yes. yes. Now, if you get that today, when you get that today, Amen. because you're going to get that today, there will be something asked of you. The kingdom doesn't revolve around you. He fills you with glory so that you can become a tent maker. Just like Priscilla and Aquila. Yeah. Just like the Apostle Paul. And I'm not just saying that because they happened to sew together garments. I'm saying it because in every place they went, they left behind them people full of the fire and glory of God. Amen. Let's look at this further in Hebrews chapter 3, and starting in verse 4. Say there when you're there. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was what, saints? Was faithful as a servant in all God's house. Now, let's evaluate that just for a second. Did he have some, a few mishaps? 
maybe a, a major mishap towards the very end. Didn't allow him to go into the promised land, right? But here in Hebrews, it's calling him a faithful servant in all of God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. I would say Moses is a faithful servant. Jesus is a perfectly faithful servant. Amen. Well, he, he is that master tent maker that we get to participate in. Well, we continue on and we are his house. We are his tent. If we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. The decision before us today is one that's really simple. As God's house, what must we do to be faithful? This is what Pastor Eric and I are trying to stir you guys in. And really since the beginning of worship, how do you need to increase your faithfulness to properly, if not perfectly, be a faithful servant in God's house? Let me be really clear. I'm not asking you to believe anything because that wouldn't do a thing for the rest of the world. I'm asking you to have faith that God will do something in you and through you. Yeah. See, to believe something is not going to require any action of you. A child can believe in Santa Claus. That requires nothing of you. I'm asking for a response to what you say you believe. I'm asking for an entire life pointed at what you say you believe. If we really believe that we are a housing for God's presence. Anytime God's presence touched the earth, the whole earth was changed because of it. Yeah. Starting with prostitutes and tax collectors. Yeah. Look, is it possible that we have sat in church for so long that somehow or another the precious nature of God visiting with a man has become numb to us? You, do you know what the prophets said to the well-churched of their day? Circumcise your hearts. Yeah. Circumcise your ears. We cannot become numb to this. The highest honor you will ever have in your life is not your next degree. Not even if it's an MD. Minor deity, you know. <laughs> not if it's a PhD. The highest honor in your life is that the God of the universe not one time would just touch you to be used, but actually inhabit you so that every moment of the day you represent him. Yeah. That is an incredible concept. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 1 with me. Say there when you were there. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, Now we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed. Now, you don't have to be a, a master linguist to get this. What kind of earthly tent is he talking about? Your body. That's because your body is a mishkan. It is a tabernacle for God's presence. Now we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. An eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Has anybody in here ever been clothed with a building? You know, if you have, that's probably a pretty bad experience. <laughs> He's talking about your body being like a tent because it's temporary. But it houses the presence of God. And there will be a day... When your body is transformed into something not temporary. That's what he's calling a building. A glorified body. A body that doesn't die. A permanent one. But he says you're clothed with it. Do you know why? That's because you don't go to mansions in heaven somewhere. That is another absurd idea from a church that is illiterate of their own Bible. The whole concept is that God wants to dwell with you now in your imperfect state while he is perfecting you. And then he will dwell with you fully in a perfect state when his work in you is done. Here on earth. Yeah. How could you have a self-esteem problem? How could you say, ah, I just don't think anybody likes me. If God wants to dwell with you, 
Yeah, I would say me and the Lord are a majority. Yeah. yeah? Amen. For while we are in this tent, we groan and we're burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God, this is important. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. Now, have you ever seen a bumper sticker said, I was made to worship God? You, know, you ever heard somebody say, well, uh, the reason God made me is he wanted me to love him? Uh, this says, now God made us for this very purpose. What purpose? To indwell you. God wants to live inside of you in the same way that he dwelt in a tent or in a temple. In fact, the Bible calls us both a tent and a temple. When's the last time you felt like that? A warm, fuzzy moment at church? Because it's supposed to be that way all of the time. Everywhere we go. Now... The reason we started this message the way we did is we have some decades doing this and in something like 40 countries. And you know what? Even when I don't particularly feel like the temple of God or the tabernacle of God or a tent for his presence, you know what we're seeing? He made us a focal point everywhere we go and men are drawn closer to the Lord because of it. Everywhere, in every country. And if he will do that, then I know he will do it forever. We all got to be tent makers, y'all. Yeah. We're going to have to start believing that God dwells, you in a, it dwells in you in a way that catches their attention and that he wants to dwell in them and stop just attending church and talking about what we believe. Yeah. It's my opinion, and we don't have time to teach it now, and I don't want to teach it, and I don't need to. We need more action and less teaching. It is my opinion that in Acts 15, when the... Apostles see what is happening with the Gentiles. The Gentiles are getting filled with the Spirit. This is incredible. They relate it to Amos 9 and say, this is what Amos said. We are rebuilding David's fallen tabernacle. They looked and went, this is tent making. We are building a habitation for God to dwell in. And who knew that it would make up all of the nations, but it's going to be made up of all of the nations. And they were excited about it. When is the last time you personally prayed for somebody to get full, filled with the Holy Ghost? See, we can do this all of the time. How many of yeah. you in here today, there's a few of you who look so miserable. I would call your name, but I'd just be honest, you look like you're sucking on lemons. Like, my God, when will this be over? Man, you're not here now. You don't have to stay. Some want to be filled with the very presence of God. If you're just doing your time here, well, you'll have your meeting with God. I want to meet with Him on good terms. I, I want Him to know of my desire for him. I want him to fill me in a way that spills over to everyone else. Yeah. Now, maybe you look like you're sucking on a lemon because you're scared. That's it. I was a coward too before he filled me with the spirit. Yeah. But you know what? He'll take a coward and fill you with courage and the whole world will notice. The very men who experienced Pentecost were hiding in an upper room before this happened. Maybe the reason your Christianity has been so weak and emaciated is you've never been filled with the almighty power of the Holy Ghost. Maybe you're a tent that has a form of godliness, but you have no actual power. Now, how would you know? You know how you would know? You're either experiencing power over sin or you're experiencing sin's power over you. There's no middle ground there. You're either moving forward in holiness, putting sin underfoot, or you're falling on your face in the same habitual area. And if anything, it's getting worse, not better. Now, you cannot be the habitation of God and the habitation of sin at the same time. You can't. I want to speak to you for a minute. Let Pastor Matthew speak to you for a minute. Some of you have a smoldering wick inside. And he doesn't want to snuff it out. 
In fact, he wants you to fan it into flame. We can have as much of his presence as we desire. The problem is, is we got full too fast. The problem is, is we're in a routine that we're going to have to kick the, the ends off of. It's become a coffin. Yeah. Do you want to experience the Lord today? Yes. yes. From the moment we walked in here today, Nick had a very encouraging prayer, but he lied. He, oh, I feel... I feel your desire for the Lord. No, there wasn't very much desire for the Lord today. I've been doing this a long time. That's Nick being really kind to you going, Lord, I feel that you want them to desire you today. It, it, was, it was godly. I'm not picking on him. Rahab makes it into the Faith Hall of Fame. And she's called a whore, but she's never called a liar. <laughs> We came in here today after an incredible service on Wednesday. Pretty flat. Worship was pretty flat. Now, if you come from a dead church, you won't think it was flat. You, you'll think we're crazy swinging from the chandeliers. For us, that was about a level two. And there is this kind of blanket in here right now. Like, there's so many ways you could do You could just dismiss it. Oh, those pastors, they're not very anointed. Yeah, we're probably not. But you'll either leave here with the presence of God filling you in a new way or you won't. And you know that's up to you. It'll be directly proportional to your hunger. You can blame anything you want, but it'll be proportional to your hunger. If you're irritated with what we're doing right now, I'll just wait till you see what we're going to do. You want the fire and glory of God? We see an expected pattern in the Word, an illustrated pattern. If we will get into unity, if we will get holy and making others holy, if we will join in a singular focus, then you can know for sure that the fire and glory of God are going to show up here. Isn't that what Paul told Timothy? He said in 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you. Where is it? In you. Where is the gift of God? In you. Through the laying on of hands. What does it take to fan something into flame? It takes effort. It takes wind. So let's say that there's a campfire in the middle of the sanctuary right here. Can I fan it into flame standing where I am right now? Probably not. No, I have to get a little bit closer. In fact, I may even have to lay down on my side so that the smoldering wick that it is doesn't burn my eyes. I lay on my side and begin to breathe life into it. That's what this service was like today as we're trying to breathe life into your hearts and souls. It's okay, Pastor. We're not done yet. No, we're not done yet. We're going to I set don't intend to make this the finish line. No, no, not at all. God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Let's be honest about what this word really is. You do some study. It's cowardice. Cowardice is that when you know something to do that is right, but you are too scared to even attempt to try and do it. Come on, let's, let's rid this house of cowardice this morning in the name of Jesus. Let's fan into flame the gift that is inside of us and watch the fire of the Holy Ghost erupt in every single soul in this room. There are three areas. I want to show them to you on a slide that we're going to begin to pray about. Three areas that we're going to look for. You are the image of the Creator. You might need to renew that. Maybe, maybe you put a, a, a whiskey dent on, on the image that shouldn't be there. Maybe it got some uh, hell damage. You know, I'm not sure what happened. But we're going to renew it today. Secondly... You can participate in the divine nature. Yeah. You, you're not supposed to see that as an option. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost today, you are like a soldier that literally has a gun and not a single bullet in it. Yeah. I mean, I, I love you, but what do you think you're going to accomplish? About as much as the denominations have accomplished in the last few hundred years. The third one, God's glory. Do you feel covered in God's glory? Because you're supposed to. Look, these are three must for us. They're, they're as important as unity. 
They're as important as holiness and singular focus. And the thing is, is the scripture says they're yours. Look, I bet if Assad's got something that he loves, I bet I couldn't just walk up and take it from him. I bet if David's got something he loves, I couldn't just walk up and take it from him. I know Spencer for a long time. I'm probably not going to walk up and just take something he loves. Friends, where is your holy fight? We ought to have a, a, a fight, the good fight of faith. Amen. You get to fight to be in the very image of God. You get to fight to participate in His nature. You get to fight to stand in His glory. You ought to have some holy fight in you this morning. Come on, is there a war cry that will raise in here? I want you to hear what Jeremiah says about it. Well, Jeremiah 20 verse 9 says, But if I say... I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. His word in my heart, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Saints, you have his perfect word inside of you. And one of the blessings of God's discipline is that even if you are trying to hold it in, he's going to shake you up and set you on fire to the point you can't stand it. Let's check this out. He's the perfect image. You're imperfect. We already established that. But you're being made perfect. He, He is the absolute glory of God. But you participate in the divine nature of God and you're getting more. Do you know what is exactly the same though? You know where you have absolutely no deficit? He is the perfect word of God and he gave you the perfect word of God. It ought to be like holy fire shut up inside of your bones. You have no deficit in this area. You have as much of it as you want to read, as much of it as you want to absorb, as much of it as you want to fan into flame, but you got to want it. Yes. Yes. And you can have it. In Zechariah 2. You don't have to turn. You can listen. I won't lie to you at this point. I'm about ready to go after the throne. 2 in verse 5. He says, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it. This is Jerusalem that is a city without walls. He's speaking of his people, his habitation, and nothing can contain it. And he is fire around it. When you begin to get the fire and glory of God in you, the fire and glory are also a wall around you. I have tried to put myself in harm's way in every possible opportunity. You are not even capable of giving up your life if you're standing in the will of God without Him allowing it. When His fire and glory is inside your mishkan, then the fire and glory of God protects His tabernacle. He goes on in verse 7 to say, Whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. Do you know why? When your eye is singularly focused on Him, His eye is singularly focused on you. Amen. Friends, what we're saying is heaven will respond to you today. But I want to I get something really clear. I have something a little bit under my skin at the moment. He doesn't know you a thing. And you're not special to Him. I know you've been told a thousand times how special you are to the Lord. Each and every one of you. What is special to him is your response to him. You're actually an enemy of the gospel if you do not respond. I didn't say believe. I said respond. What makes you special to him is your response to him. Otherwise, you'll burn up exactly like hay, wood, and stubble. That's not his desire. It's what you show your desire is when you will not respond. You know, if you really want to get to know this God of ours, find out what he says he's going to do to Moab. Find out what he's covered in in Revelation 19. He is an extraordinary father. And he's been making an appeal through ambassadors. Those ambassadors are tents that carry around his presence. It's up to you to respond to that. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can respond between you and him. And he will come through and answer you. 
Say, well, I tried once and it didn't work. I'm sure the problem was not with him. No. You tried once. Have you tried harder to chew a whole pack of gum or harder to find God? Harder to find where you're going to eat after church or harder to find God? We cannot cross our arms, sit back and act like he owes us something or loves us so much we don't have to do anything. He's the sovereign of the universe. And most of your lives, most of the time, you have ignored him. Let that sink in for a minute. And he has lavished on you his love. And all he wants to do is empower you towards his purpose and his ends. He's not a TV preacher that wants your money and neither am I. He's not somebody social networking in a group looking to use you for selfish purposes. He literally wants you to be filled with his image. Filled with his glory. He wants you to be filled with With him, like fire shut up in your bones. Honestly answer that question. Are you filled with him like a fire shut up in your bones? You can't help but tell. You can't wait to tell. Or can you just not wait for the service to be over so you can get back to doing what you want to do? This message demands a response. Because it's a message that God has been speaking from the beginning. That his image and his glory, his fire, is to dwell within us. Because he wants to perfectly reflect who he is inside of you. That's why he made you. John 15 verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Hey, how's that work for decisionism? How many of you chose to follow Jesus? I made a choice to respond to his choice to pursue me. Yeah. His spirit is drawing some of you in the room. Some of you may have a different experience with his spirit. We'll see. He is choosing to make himself known to you. The first way that he does that is by telling you what he will do with you, transform you. Whether you were a Republican or a Democrat, if the President of the United States was standing here in most decades in our society, if he said, come here, I want to do something with you, you wouldn't sit back and say, I'll pray about it, I'll think about it. If God's Spirit is beginning to deal with you, do you really have the audacity to tell the sovereign God of the universe who have to wait while you think about it? He's choosing you. He may never do it again. Yeah. Let that sink in. The purpose of him choosing you is to appoint you to go and bear fruit. And not just any kind of fruit or sporadic but fruit that will last. He's calling every single one of us to be tent makers, to go and bear fruit of who he is in his image, to go and bear fruit by imparting fire and glory in other people because it's the very thing that we have received. You know, in this very chapter, Jesus also makes the connection that every branch in him that does not bear fruit, he cuts off and throws into the fire. Attached to the same vine, Two different branches having two different results. We want you to be the branch that is filled with the fire and glory of God, not the branch that is thrown into the fire of his judgment. So that you can go and bear the fruit of the image of who God is. That through your lives, the glory of God can be displayed and then that fire not go out in which was started in you originally. He wants to build a dwelling for his name. 
That's what Pastor Matthew and Pastor Treaster were preaching about last Sunday. Yeah. He wants to build a dwelling for the whole world to know what His name is like. Wednesday, He wants to fill you with His fire and His glory. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants to fill you with His presence. Come on, man. Yeah. He is commanding us to become tent makers. You can't go make something that you are not. You can go to seminary, but that will not make you a tent maker. I know many people that went into seminary dead and came out even more dead if that was possible. You have to experience the presence of God. And the more of Him you experience, the more you want others to have that experience. Now, I've been a little bit hard on some of you. Some of you not nearly hard enough. But I want to share something with you. I know what it's like. I watched him at 16 years old get so full of the presence of God that it shook up everybody around us. I joined him in that. I have never lived in a city where we didn't make disciples. Not once. I've never been to a job where Christians didn't result because of it. I've never been to another country where we didn't share the gospel and see lives wrecked. So I want to ask you something. What do you lack? Whatever that is, you can ask Him for. Yeah. Say, Lord, You said You would renew me in Your image. I've tarnished it. And I, I, renew me. And the Spirit of the Lord is here saying, Yes, yes, that's what I want. I want you to be the focal point that they see. I want them to see the kingdom of God in you. I want them to know about my goodness by looking at you. I'll do it. What do you lack? Do you need fire? Do you need go What is it that you lack? So, oh, Pastor, I'm doing pretty good. I'm like, then where are your disciples? Yeah. Where are they? See, you're being discipled well. But it will never be a success until you are discipling others well. Yeah. yeah? And you cannot make what you are not. It doesn't matter what country your pastors go to, what time period we're in. Advantage, disadvantage makes no difference. Our lives bear fruit every single year. How many years you've been born again and how proud of that are you? Come on now. We can do this together, but it's going to come from you recognizing you have a desperate need. One you didn't take seriously when you walked in this building today. You have a desperate need. For the very presence and fire of God. And if you won't respond to that, I'm just going to be completely honest. We've got no business together at all. What you're going to see and feel in me is what you see and feel in God. That is, you are rejected. But if you want that, if, if that's what you want, you can have that. You can have it in a greater abundance than you ever knew that you could have it. Oh, my prayer for you is that you want that. Man. Moses saw a bush on fire and he couldn't stay away. What do you think will happen when people see your lives on fire? What will happen? When you are reflecting the glory of God instead of the latest thing you shouldn't have clicked on. What will happen when the greatest pursuit of your heart is the next victorious leap of faith rather than the next fight with your spouse? Friends, if we'll get united in here, if we'll get holy in here, Holy is doing what He tells you to do. That's what holiness is. If we'll get holy in here and help our brothers get holy. I've kicked some of you. I've encouraged some of you. I, I, I'm, I'm not a shy person. If it takes personal interaction, we'll do that. My goal is for every single man, woman, and child in here to walk out differently than they walked in. And if that wasn't your goal, then what are you doing here? But the good news is you can. He did it for two scared kids. Then he did it for our friends. He's done it in every city that we've ever been. He'll do it right here, right now. I have no lack of confidence God will meet you here. My only concern 
is do you genuinely want to meet with him? Or are you just screwing around? You're just passing time. In just a minute, we're going to worship. Some are going to have an extraordinary experience with God. My goal is not some, though. It's all. It's all. Every one of us. You can have that. We're giving away scratch-off tickets. I think people would run and get them. We might need to dust off our love for the Lord this morning. There's a few of you I can really see the Spirit drawing. I'm praying for your courage. The God of the universe to call you. I, don't, I didn't believe he would call me. And I didn't have to be convinced he did. I felt it myself. No one else was around. Nobody will ever convince me he didn't meet with me. You know when you've been gotten. <laughs> if you're still kind of on the fence, you're not sure, let me assure you, you're on the wrong side of the fence. There's no such thing as I kind of think I'm sort of maybe right with God. There's no chance you're right with God if that's your thought. You either are burning with a love and an intensity for Him that surpasses everything else in this world or you're damned in pretending to be saved in church. Hey, let's stand to our feet. Saints, I want to encourage you as we get ready to pray. One of the greatest enemies to the fire of God being revived in our souls is apathy. And that is waiting for somebody else to come down forward and get filled and full of fire on their own. And you just stand next to them and enjoy the warmth of their flame. Let's throw off apathy. Let's learn as believers and fired up saints to know how to push through a bronze ceiling. Let's push through apathy and reservedness. Let's hunger and thirst and go after the presence of God because it's what we need at all times. There's never a second of any part of day that we shouldn't be hungering and thirsting and possessing this fire of God. Let it stir within you. Mighty God, we lift up to you our souls. We lift up to you our spirits. And we say that we are hungry this morning. We are thirsty. Right now, Lord, show us by your spirit where we are out of shalom, out of order with you in unity, out of order with you in holiness, out of order with you with singular focus. Realign our hearts with your heart. Realign our desires with your desires. And then let your fire fall and fill us. Fill us anew, mighty God. Let apathy be driven far away from us. And let your fire and glory fill us as we seek your image, as we seek your heart, and as we seek your presence.